Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 280 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. In this lecture, we'll be stepping away from uh, these discussions of games as games, looking at games in terms of aesthetics or code or rules, uh, and talk about the surrounding culture around this. We'll be taking a cultural studies perspective, sociological perspective, uh, looking at what's going on uh, with the players and the stuff happening around games, but also how games are impacting our culture, uh, whether that be American culture or we won't really get into uh, Japanese culture, but that's an interesting topic too. Uh, I think you could have a really good, uh, really good lecture on that. Uh, but anyway, uh, this chapter is broken into two pieces. Uh, we'll talk first about the uh, cultural position of video games. You know, what do we think about video games? Are they highbrow, lowbrow? <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, and then we'll get into gamer culture, which is looking at gamers uh, as a subculture. Actually, th this quote comes in at the end of the chapter, but I thought it's a good way to start off, actually. So this is T.L. Taylor, who gets uh, cited a lot in game studies. He says, I call for nine dichotomous models. I don't know why I use such a expensive word there, very fancy word, non-dichotomous. Uh, the other word for that might be something like non-binary or just non-either or logic. You know, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all, uh, there, or there's more than just two mo options here. Uh, but anyway, moving on from that term, uh, one of the biggest lessons in internet studies is that the boundary between online and offline life is messy, contested, and constantly under negotiation. And so this is kind of how these uh, professional game studies scholars talk, uh, which can kind of goes over a lot of people's heads. It's uh, not necessarily easy, uh, even for me, to understand what Taylor's talking about here. But uh, when we, I think, when we think about the concept, uh, it's something we've probably all thought about. <laughs> we have a lot of us play games online. <laughs> I played a lot of World of Warcraft and. Uh, or just playing games in general, there's a tendency for other people who don't play games uh, to see that and say, well, you aren't, you're, just, you're spending all your time in this fantasy world, in this virtual world. Why don't you, come, why don't you go outside? <laughs> why don't you go, go sit, spend some time in the real world with your real friends? And I think what Taylor's getting at here is that for us, it's not really that like there's a clear boundary between my internet friends or my World of Warcraft friends and my the friends that live next to me, uh, you know, the friends I see at work, <laughs> basically. Uh, this idea of an online and an offline life or a video game life and a non-gaming life being totally separate is sort of blurry for us, which is kind of what I take from a Taylor, uh, which I think is an interesting question or an interesting thing for you to think about some more. And so I made that the first question here. Uh, so we think about this term avatar, it's got some, I think it comes out of uh, the Hindu religion, if I'm not mistaken on that, uh, this concept. But anyway, in terms of video games, it just refers to the character that you're playing. Uh, if you're playing uh, uh, Halo, your avatar is Master Chief, right? If you're playing Tomb Raider, it's uh, Lara Croft. Uh, just think about any game where you play as a character. That character is sort of standing in for you. You're controlling that character. Of course, if you're playing World of Warcraft, you're, you've got a character like a gnome, rogue, or uh, an orc, uh, a shaman, or something. Uh, that's your avatar. All right, so what I want you to do is think about your favorite game and think about your relationship to that avatar. So do you feel like this avatar is kind of just like a chess piece? You know, it's not... It could look like anything. It's not really important what it looks like. It's not really part of you. It's just a piece on a game board. You've got no sort of attachment to it. Uh, or is it more like an extension of a, of a limb? You know, so does this feel like another arm? <laughs> like an extension of, you know, like one with the sword or whatever. Uh, or like a second skin that you slip into. Is it uh, like a second self? Or maybe you consider this your primary self. Uh, you know, there's people that say that's who I really am is this avatar uh, in Second Life, if you ever played that. I know people that they consider that to be their real life. And then the uh, what goes on in their meat suits <laughs> is secondary uh, to that. But anyway, it's kind of far out. I just want you to think about it for a while, describe it, and then I will move on. 
All right, so the impact of game studies or game studies on culture, how have game studies members of that community, uh, people who call themselves uh, game scholars, uh, how are they looking at games and culture? And again, we sort of have these uh, dichotomous model, if you will, or <laughs> two basic uh, approaches. One is to look at games as artifacts of popular culture. So we could say, look, we got this this culture over here, they're playing all these games. Uh, let's take a look at the games they're playing and see what we can learn uh, from that, from those games about their culture. Makes sense, right? Uh, you could do that with any other form of media. You know, what films are they? do they like? What books are they reading? You know, imagine if you're an alien coming down from another planet and you're, you want to learn, like, what, who are these American kids? <laughs> you know, we're, we're, like, puzzled by them. Uh, let's see what we can learn about them. Well, you might look at, you know, they're watching these cartoons, they're playing these video games, uh, and you can learn about them that way. Uh, the second one is games form the basis of many gamer subcultures or uh, communities. So there are, again, professional sociologists, not gamers per se, but just people who study people, basically. Uh, so they will spend some time in something like Guild Wars or Fortnite, uh, World of Warcraft, and they'll sort of lurk there. <laughs> Sometimes they play the games. Uh, but they're there to learn about this subculture. You know, who are these people playing these games? What are they like? Uh, so it's that sort of study. All right, so here's the second question for you. So in what ways does your gaming affect other aspects of your life? Is gaming totally separate from your other life activities and relationships? Or do you find, like me, some significant overlap? <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of hard to separate out, like, my real life from my gaming life. We don't really have that. We don't kind of make that sort of uh, cut. At least I don't. Um, anyway, what do you think? How does your gaming affect your uh, other aspects of your life while you're not gaming? All right, so moving on. Uh, before we talked about this concept of the magic circle, I think that was Huizinga, Huizinga, and this idea that the when we play games, it's kind of like basketball or something. You have this well-defined court or football, you know, you got the football field, you know, and everything, the game happens kind of in, within that field of wrestling, you know, you got the ring, you know, there's always some kind of <clears throat> defined, demarcated zone uh, where the game takes place, and once you're outside of that zone, that circle, that ring, that court, whatever, uh, you're not playing the game anymore. It's, it's, <laughs> it's I, I use this idea like the hermetically sealed uh, jar or something, so you got... Uh, you're in either in the jar or you're not in the jar, right? It's kind of the idea. And what happens inside this ring, uh, the outside world doesn't come into it. You know, you're playing basketball. You're not thinking about taxes, <laughs> hopefully, uh, or whatever. And so it is this idea of this sort of special place we set aside to play games in. And we all realize that and we don't uh, have to worry about the real world uh, blurring into that somehow. Uh, but there's been a lot of criticism of this idea. I mean, I just don't think it makes much sense. Uh, maybe you do. I'd like to hear your thoughts if, you know, if, you, if you think this is how it works. But uh, King and Krasinski, Krasinski, Kras not quite sure how to pronounce that person's name. Uh, but anyway, they just make the point pretty obvious to me. Gameplay does not exist in a vacuum like this, right? And there's, there's some sense where you can't just set everything aside uh, when you're playing a game. And, and likewise, when you quit playing the game, some aspects of that will follow you uh, from the game world into your uh, other worlds. Okay, then when they talk about the cultural position of video games, games as cultural forms, and then the public perception of games, which I, I think is quite rightfully that they, they divide this into two uh, positions here. Uh, so first of all, just games as a cultural form. This uh, word uh, cultural form, you know, I'd probably call it more like a medium. <laughs> I know some people in game studies, they don't like this term medium uh, for games. But you know, I think about uh, games the same way you might, well, we had novels, we had radio shows, we have TV shows. And games are just sort of in there as another form, right? It's, it's a form where you can, I guess, express cultures, cultures... Uh, this is part of our culture, you know, it's, it's cultural expression, artistic expression, however you want to put it. Uh, but 
the authors of this book make a pretty good point that every new medium or every cultural forum that comes out, initially anyway, there's a lot of public distrust of it, a lot of skepticism. Uh, and this is the key part, I think. Where is all the skepticism coming from? It's the elite, you know, the people in power, you know, the people who have something to lose, basically. Uh, they're invested in the old system. Uh, so, of course, they're going to be very skeptical of this new thing, you know, whatever the kids these days are doing. And if we don't have to go too far back, you can think about uh, when I was growing up, Dungeons and Dragons was the thing, right? This is this is devil worship. Uh, this is going to, you know, kids think that the magic is real. Uh, they're going to go and kill their friends and sacrifice, ritual sacrifices. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> uh, they just, they didn't understand it. They didn't want to understand it. They just wanted to ban it. Um, same thing with... Uh, uh, heavy metal music. It was all this stuff about uh, Ozzy Osbourne. And, you know, rap went through the same uh, nonsense, right? Uh, this is going to, the kids will be out uh, shooting uh, police officers because they listen to this song. Uh, so it's, it's all that kind of stuff. But if we go further back, we find it. They say it's the uh, same thing about the television, same thing about radio. Uh, but if we go all the way back to Plato. <laughs> Plato is saying this about writing. It's like we can't have writing. Writing is this terrible invention. It's going to make people uh, think they're smarter than they are. It's going to destroy our ability to remember anything. Uh, so that's a pretty good point. So in, in some sense, it's not really surprising that people would be skeptical about games because they've been skeptical basically about everything else. <laughs> uh, I'll say, uh, question three. And so have you ever been shamed... Or just felt bad yourself, shamed yourself, or ashamed about your gaming habits? Uh, do you feel that playing games is a quote-unquote waste of time that could be better spent engaging in a more sophisticated or active activity such as reading a novel or playing sports? Uh, so think about this. How did you feel about this? Why do you think it is that you know people are okay with somebody watching uh you know, hours and hours of sports on TV, but somehow spending that same amount of time playing a video game, somehow that's a waste of time, right? <laughs> uh, what What's up with that? Uh, so try to write at least 100 words on this, and then come back and we'll move on. All right, so why are games targeted in this fashion? And the authors make some good points. And a lot of people have asked me in the... You know, at the end of these lectures, I had this spot where I said, do you have any questions? And a lot of the questions are, well, how is this in Japan? Is it the same in Japan? And of course, it's not. <laughs> not just Japan. A lot of other countries, a lot of other cultures, it's the, it's the opposite. Uh, so that's kind of weird to think about if you've just grown up in this, you know, American culture. You don't know much about other <clears throat> other cultures. But so much of this is unique at least to not maybe not just to America but to these western countries as soon as you go somewhere else it's different and so that's important to keep in mind uh, but anyway why are games targeted here uh, one is that they're primarily a visual medium uh, the cultural elites they tend to not like anything that's too visual uh, comic books same thing cartoons I mean I still run into people it's just you know <laughs> just like what they act so shocked Oh my God! I was watching this cartoon, and it had like uh, curse words in it, and it was a lot of violence in that cartoon. This comic book, <clears throat> you know, and what? How? What must the you know the kids think when they read this? And you're like, this is not for kids. <laughs> this is not, you know, the, the comics are not all like you know Donald Duck and Goofy uh, in cartoons. You know, there's this whole spectrum of uh, entertainment, and some of these are definitely not meant for kids. And then they look at you like, well. You know, what kind of grown-up would want to watch uh, a cartoon? You know, it's just there's just some kind of dis <laughs> disconnect there. Uh, they don't get it. Uh, but it is because you know this, this tradition. Of, well, if you if you take yourself seriously, if you're a mature person, you you grow out of comics, or you grow out of cartoons, uh, you grow out of books with pictures in it, and you certainly grow out of video games. Right? This is something you need to leave behind and, and start reading. Uh, Oh, I don't know, The New Yorker, <laughs> listening to Mozart <laughs> and going uh, to hear symphonies. You know, I don't know. Uh, but that's certainly something that hangs around. 
Uh, two, many games intended to make money. Oh, no, right? Uh, the true art should be something done for its own sake. Uh, this one seems a little bit strange even to me, but... You know, this idea, if you're doing something primarily to make money, like you want this to be a bestseller, uh, and that's, you know, a motivator, uh, then some people say, well, that's, we shouldn't take that seriously, right? The, only, the real, I see this in film studies too, like the real films are being made uh, by independent studios at the Sundance Film Festival, and, no, you know, nobody cares if it's a flop commercially. Uh, that's Maybe that's even a good thing if it flops commercially, uh, and it costs money to make these. Uh, the purpose is for the art, right? <laughs> they sort of frown on anything uh, that makes a lot of money. You know, it's, it's sick as we sometimes to hear uh, people will just, they'll, they'll just have these really negative reactions to things like, uh, remember the Harry Potter books when those came, came out? Like a big success and it's making all this money. And then there were people that were basically bashing it for that reason. Uh, or or be probably a better example is the, uh, what is it, the Twilight series, you know, things of that sort, and they'll say, well, you know, there must be something bad about it if it's making, <laughs> you know, if, if all the masses like it, uh, there must be something wrong with it. You know, it's kind of a warped way to live your life, uh, <laughs> uh, but not just making money there. I would just say anything that's really a big popular success, some people are going to turn their nose, you know, nose up at it and say, well, that's, you know, that's okay for the masses, but, you know, those with taste uh, prefer... <laughs> Who knows? Uh, three, many games are meant to be fun, uh, whereas real art is challenging and an acquired taste. Right, so this is, yeah, the, the music that uh, the elites like, you know, the idea is you need to take courses on it. You take, take like a musical appreciation class or, or art appreciation, right? And they basically teach you, like, why should you care? What, what's so great about Mozart? Uh, what's so great about Bach? You know, and so on and so forth. Uh, you don't really have to teach, you don't have to have a class like this uh, before you uh, find the games are fun. Right? I don't have to sort of persuade you the games are fun and that you should enjoy them. Uh, you just do it, right? Uh, but that just that's a sign there that it's not real art. If it was uh, real art, it would be, there would be a lot of, uh, there'd be a barrier, right? You'd have to really uh, work at it to acquire a taste for it. Uh, so I think these these are all points I don't, know about you, but I've certainly heard these kind of views expressed over and over again. Now, on the subject of taste, uh, there's typically uh, two uh, tastes, if you will, the lowbrow entertainment and the highbrow entertainment. So I would say I got Hamilton, a little uh, shot of Hamilton up here in the top right corner. And this one's kind of interesting to me because on the one hand, it's, it's, a, broad, it's a Broadway show most people don't care about Broadway musicals, that sort of thing. I mean, you can sort of look at the at the audience here. You know, everybody's you know, fairly well dressed. <laughs> uh, they look like they're fairly wealthy people, uh, right? They're, I'm sure, and this is very. They, they sort of feel like going to see Hamilton will uh, give them some uh, cultural cred, you know, if you will. This is sophisticated entertainment. Uh, what I find interesting, though, because it's it's kind of the opposite as well, right? Because the if you, you know, Hamilton is, is bringing in all this uh, rap music and hip hop, you know, and so in some ways it's kind of uh, uh, playing around with that model. But you know, I'd still say, you know, I think it, who was it? John Kerry spent something like uh, forty thousand or twenty thousand, fifty thousand, some ridiculous amount of cash <laughs> to go see Hamilton. <laughs> you know, if that doesn't smack of a cultural elitism, I don't know what. Uh, what well, does, but uh, anyway, you can imagine, you know, people like this, right? And they're like, well, I want to go see this thing, uh, this this play downtown, or uh, this. I want to go see this art exhibit, go to this art gallery, you know, something along those lines. And you're kind of like, wow, that sounds really boring. Uh, <laughs> and they give you this look of, well, that's just because you lack the sophistication, my friend. <laughs> you know, you're clearly of the lower caste. Yes, you, you should probably go see the WWE. <laughs> you know, we have a professor here in the creative writing. She wrote a book called uh, something like All of God's Children Go Bowling. <laughs> you know, I thought that kind of really, uh, you know, really gets at this concept well, right? Do you, do you prefer bowling or golf? You know, well, I'm a golfer. You know. 
I play tennis. You know, I would never <laughs> imagine going to one of those bowling alleys. Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay, I'm being a little silly here, but hopefully you're, this idea is coming across, right? And uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, he's a sociologist, and we have sociology professors here. And one of my uh, friends, Anne, uh, teaches sociology here. And she says that Bourdieu is her favorite uh, scholar. Uh, so I wanted to put him on, on this slide here. Uh, so his quote is talking about taste. He says, taste is not individual. So when you say that, well, I prefer Hamilton. Well, I prefer WWE Raw. And they say, well, that's not just a matter of that's just what you like. You know, you like what you like. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got their own taste. And so Purdue says, that's, there's more to it than that. It's not just a personal thing, a personal whim. Uh, it's more of a social uh, factor. So this is, there's things that are affecting your love of WWE Raw or NASCAR uh, or whatever it is uh, that are more, it's more than just a personal opinion. So Purdue puts it this way. It's a means to establish boundaries uh, by signaling one's membership of a certain social group. Which I, I think these two examples here are perfect for this, right? So you think, well, I'm the type of person who goes to see Hamilton. Well, I'm the type of person that goes to see WWE Raw. <laughs> you know, there's all the merchandising, there's all the clothing, there's all these ways that we uh, use sort of what we prefer, our preferred type of entertainment in a way sort of defines us as a group. And I would We'll talk a little bit more about gaming, where gaming fits into this. Uh, we, talk, we talked a little bit already about, like, are you the hard, you consider yourself the hardcore gamer, are you the, the casual gamer? Uh, what kind of games are you playing? Uh, do you go for games that are more sophisticated, more artistic? Uh, or do you like the, you know, more basically the, the equivalent of that WWE Raw <laughs> in gaming format? Let's see, everyday taste from highbrow to lowbrow classified on this chart so i forget where i got this <clears throat> but i think this gets the idea across all right so down here at the bottom left we have the low brow and they, these folks are walking around in old army clothes and loafers and jackets i don't know i don't know when this is actually kind of dated <laughs> uh, but they like beer you know and, and comic books and if you go a little bit up you get to bourbon and ginger ale and then finally at the very top we've got this aqualite adequate little red wine <laughs> I'm not, I drink the wine I like the <laughs> little magazine criticisms of criticisms avant-garde literature <laughs> now, so you could have some fun with this chart thing like where do I fit into here you know craps bridge <laughs> what the heck is this the game <laughs> what is that that looks like, kind of like maybe charades and what's at the top there go yeah so you know, something that's nobody else knows how to play, I guess. Okay, so modern views on this. Uh, this idea of the low brow and high brows, a lot of people have challenged it. Not that there aren't people that prefer this stuff. That's not what it's about. It's just saying there's nothing intrinsic about um, bridge or what was it? Uh, there's nothing intrinsic about bridge or the game or go that makes it better somehow than craps. There's nothing about a comic book that makes it just just the fact that it's a comic book means it's not as good as a you know this novel. Uh, so they really kind of tried to challenge this idea. Uh, Andy Warhol, um, who is this uh, Roy Lichtenstein, I think is his name, uh, did some art in these art galleries where it looks like comics, but you know it's, since it's in the context of an art gallery, you know it kind of repositioned the idea of the you know is it highbrow is it lowbrow well normally i think this is just a comic book but, but you know here it is in an art gallery <laughs> it's like 50 million dollars <laughs> for this painting uh you know so he sort of they're really kind of playing around with this idea and arguing this is the quote here that no particular type should be privileged so you can't just look at a comic book and say well since it's a or video game say so, well since that's a video game it must be inferior to this novel or to this painting or whatever uh, so the modern view on that is you can't it's not really fair to say that it's kind of silly even to try to judge something just based on the, uh, the the phenomenon or the form that it takes the type 
So I would follow up on this, all this conversation about are games art? Is it not art? It's kind of a silly argument, really, uh, simply because all these forms communicate meaning. And really, if you are if you are the type of person that's like stays up all night wondering, like, well, is it art? <laughs> is it not art? Uh, that probably says more about the social, uh, your social uh, outlook than anything. Like, basically, what you're saying is, I, I really want to be perceived as this highbrow, you know, elite type. I don't want to be in there with the <laughs> in, the, in that WWE Raw crowd. And so it says more about you sociologically speaking than it does. Uh, you know, anything to do with the form of a game. And then there's, moving on then, uh, to games and culture, sort of like the same thing I said earlier with comics and cartoons. I mean, there are, there's DuckTales. <laughs> uh, there's also the stuff happening on the, the Cartoon Network and, you know, uh, all these uh, more advanced uh, shows, certainly uh, anything, a lot of anime. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell you this, right? It's A lot of this is way more than just sort of childish, uh, you know, goofy sort of amusement. It's very, some of it's very sophisticated indeed. You have to watch it two or three times to uh, understand it. Let's see, Flanagan argues, Mary Flanagan argues, they can be designed for artis artistic, political, social critique, or intervention. And I got a little example here of a game I wanted to show you briefly. This is called uh, Papers, Please. You can see it playing out there in the corner. But in the one sense, it's a video game. You know, it's on Steam. It's a, Some people take a look at this and say, well, that's a casual game. It's kind of got a pixelated look to the graphics. But you don't have to play this for long before you start to think about, well, what is, what are we looking at here? And what are these, what are the rules of this game? And what are they suggesting? And you find out it's got a lot to do with immigration and who gets admitted into the country, who is denied, and the role that you saw the newspaper there plays in this. And it gets you to thinking about the government and policies around immigration and citizenship. And it kind of gets to you when you play this game. I've, I've assigned this to students before. And, you know, some of them cried once they played this enough and they it just really got to them. Uh, so I don't think, I think Flanagan is right here. You certainly wouldn't play something like this you know, you might disagree with the message or whatever, but you can't say that's just a, a frivolous, you know, it's not tic-tac-toe, it's not solitaire. <laughs> you know, that sort of game does seem to be talking to us in the way that, uh, you know, something like a, a great book, Kill a Mockingbird or uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, autobiographies of uh, famous people. You know, a lot of these books, same way, these, these books sort of change our behavior. We read these, we're inspired. Uh, same thing with some a game like that, you know, could move you. Uh, they were getting into like the way that the media has covered games. And I remember when this discussion was happening. So there's, it seemed like the mass media, maybe it's because they are in the television business or the radio business or newspapers. So of course they're not going to like the video games, right? This is kind of a threat. You know, they don't want people playing these games. <laughs> they don't want you to get your news from Facebook. <laughs> you know, tune in to CNN, right? So, of course, they're going to be bashing uh, whatever the new format is. And so there's a little bit of that going on. But even in this, a lot of the early studies, it's all this really negative stuff. and just really shoddy scholarship. Uh, the problem is, and I've talked about this before, like a lot of these studies and they get cited and cited all over the place but it'd be something just as silly somebody like goes to the walmart <laughs> back in the day and they take like pictures or they'd get the the box art and they would say look at the art you know look th this game has a dude with a big knife and in the back there's a a lady a scantily clad and all this stuff and it's just this sort of stuff over and over. Clearly, this is this is sexist. This is violent. Uh, you know, and they never actually saw the game, which if I should have had a screenshot of this game. <laughs> it's actually sort of this cutesy little uh, platforming game. You know, I'm pretty sure that whoever did this artwork probably didn't play the game either. It's got very little to do with the game. You know, especially back then, that would often be the case. <laughs> uh, who knows where this art, who did the art, whether even they even seen the game. Uh, so it doesn't make much sense to be talking about games 
in not actually playing the games. <laughs> you know, the artwork is kind of it's it's kind of like judging a book by its cover. You know, it'd be like somebody going and just taking a look, a look at a bunch of uh, covers of novels and then saying, well. I don't actually need to play, read these books. I, I can tell you about them just by reading, looking at the covers. <laughs> you know, look, they're, uh, all the, the, the these covers with these guys with no shirts on. You know, but clearly these this is a, a pornography bookstore. What? <laughs> so anyway, it's just it's shoddy work. Uh, shoddy work. Uh, and then furthermore, a lot of these claims, again, somebody just make these unfounded claims. They'll just say, well, clearly the games are causing people to be sexist. You know, if you play something like this, it'll turn you into a sexist, violent person with a big knife. <laughs> we want, you'll, be, you'll let your kids play this game, and next thing you know, they're out in the swamp <laughs> in a Jeep with an alligator and a big knife. Uh, it's stupid, really. Uh, but it just it gets cited over and over again, right? play the games then they'll be just the kids will be just like the uh, characters in the games acting out the same behavior is there any evidence to back that up well no <laughs> let's stop us from uh, doing it over and over again uh, and then they will uh, cherry pick what's called cherry picking these examples and this to me is just the most heinous thing uh, so they'll pick a game like Postal or Ethnic Cleansing or that Mortal Kombat one we were looking at last time. And they'll show you like the most violent, gory, disturbing parts of these games. And uh, then make out like, well, this is games. You know, this is what this is what the kids are playing. This is what people are into. <clears throat> and you're like, I never even heard of that game. I, I never played this Postal game. I, I certainly wouldn't play this Ethnic Cleansing thing. Uh I don't know anybody who does. I mean, the only people I ever hear talking about it are people that want to bash games as being like, a, you know, this hateful thing. You know, it, it, again, it could be kind of like going into a video store. You know, if you're old enough to remember Blockbuster. Uh, but it'd be like, I'm sure you go to Blockbuster and you could find these really awful, terrible movies that just kind of make you cringe and make it out like, well, this is movies. This is American cinema. <laughs> you know, look. <laughs> when really it's just this bizarre thing that nobody would watch except as a joke. Uh, so there's a lot of that just terrible scholarship out there. And it unfortunately just gets cited over and over and over again and people buy into it. All right, so that's the shoddy stuff. Uh, thankfully, we are getting now to a point where we've got scholars like Ian Bogost here Bogos, good example, somebody who grew up actually playing games, knows what he's talking about. He's a real gamer and not just somebody looking at covers <laughs> of games, <laughs> uh, but knows, you know, what he's talking about. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, scholars like this now, but uh, they, they have to fight an uphill battle sometimes. But anyway, he's got this concept called procedural rhetoric. And he defines this as the art of persuasion through rule-based representations and interactions rather than the spoken word, writing, images, or moving pictures. He says video games are computational artifacts that have cultural meaning as computational artifacts. So it's not just how the games look, you know, of course not the box art, uh, but what can we do with them that produces meaning? So I think I always thought this was just a really smart way, smart thing that he's doing here. Because he's kind of combining those two threads we talked about last time. Like, you want to think about the game as a game. You know, there are there is code underlying this thing. It's interactive. You know, things are happening. And, and that's really what makes video games interesting from a perspective of uh, rhetoric. And if you don't, like, rhetoric is meant to be something like the art of persuasion. Aristotle uh, talks about it in the context of making a great speech. So if you want to learn how to make a great speech at the Senate or in a courtroom, uh, but it's much more than that. Uh, you could make, uh, you could persuade people by having them play a game, and the way that uh, Bogo says that happens is through the these procedures. <clears throat> so he gives a bunch of examples. We'll get into uh, one of the ones that he talks a lot about is the. I think it was called Tax Invaders or something, some cheesy game. <laughs> uh, but some of these uh, politicians back in, I don't know if they did it last time, but to kind of appeal to younger voters, they made these video games, uh, little flash games, and put them out on the internet. I think there was a company called uh, Jib Jab or something. <coughs> 
But anyway, if you played these games, you would see like, well, if I do the, uh, it'd be like George W. Bush is a little guy at the bottom of the, a little head at the bottom, and he'd be shooting at the taxes coming down. <laughs> and he'd be like, well, the idea there is, you know, he's going to get rid of taxes. So this is kind of, this is showing you how this will work. <laughs> you know, silly example. Uh, we'll look at some much better examples, but that's basically the idea. Instead of just telling somebody something or showing some pictures or uh, a, a, a film, uh, you give them something to play, you know, something they can do, they can click around, interact with it. But that could also be persuasive in nature. And the I think this is probably the best example of one of these games. And Bogost has a whole book called Persuasive Games. I highly recommend it. He's he's a really good writer. He's not uh, it's not impossible to understand like some of the game studies stuff. It's actually very clear. But this is a game. It's called uh, as you can see. This put out by the Army, U.S. Army. It's called America's Army. And this is uh, the purpose of this game is to get recruits. So you know the people they want. The army is always looking for a few good people, right? So they, maybe that's the Marines. <laughs> but anyway, they want people to go down to the, you know, to the office, recruitment office, recruitment center, and sign up to be uh, soldiers, right? So the idea was they'd make this game and make it fun to play. And then uh, the, the kids or the young folks, whoever's playing this, uh, at least some of them might be convinced by this. that You know, this this feels good. I like this. This is fun. <laughs> Maybe I should sign up for the real deal. <laughs> now, I don't know if they're really showing it. Bogus goes into some details about this game. It looks just kind of like a standard first-person shooter, just looking at these uh, screenshots here. But there's actually a lot of procedures built into it that teach you about the uh, the Army rules, like the real-life Army uh, policies and things. Like I think he mentions, they mentioned in this book, you can't point your rifle at each other, like <laughs> you'll get uh, dinged for that. There's a bunch of little things that kind of reinforce the army's uh, uh, values, uh, sort of built into the game. Uh, but it's a, it's a really, you know, apparently this is working better than any of those old TV commercials, uh, the posters and things of that sort. You know, people they they play that game, and then they at least enough of them sign up. You know, for the army, they enlist. Uh, that it makes it worth uh, the Army's time and money to keep bringing, uh, investing in this game and making it better. All right, then we have Miguel uh, Seeger. Seeger. And he's talking about games as moral objects. So he says, Games are moral objects that make players reflect on their actions. The game's rules shape the moral responsibility of its players. Uh, so even an immoral game can teach us by enacting the unethical experience, we learn that there is no fun in committing these acts, but rather mirroring the lack of morals in the desperate situation of the main character in the fictional world. And so I have an example here of uh, Skyrim. I know a lot of you play have played Skyrim, so you can steal. You know, and do worse things in this game, and sometimes you can steal and get away with it just fine. Go steal stuff, sell it. <laughs> <laughs> and so some people would see that and say, look, that's a horrible thing. We need to ban this game immediately. You know, it's teaching uh, kids it's okay to steal, that it's fun to steal uh, things and do uh, criminal acts. Uh, but Cigar here is saying, well, just, you know, hold up. <laughs> Don't jump to conclusions so quickly. Maybe there's a little something more to it going on here. Uh, well, for one thing, in this game, you can get caught. You know, and bad things will happen to you. Uh, but even if it was, even if there wasn't something like that, and you could just steal with impunity, uh, we still might be learning about this. You know, thinking, well, I can steal. I have the power to do this, but it doesn't feel right to me. You know, and you start thinking about the the plight of a character who might be in a position where they have to uh, steal just to survive. And you think about these sort of post-apocalyptic games and so on. And it's not like you think, wow, I would love to live in a world like Fallout. <laughs> uh, instead, it kind of drives the point home, right? I'm really glad I don't live in a world like Fallout because I wouldn't want people doing to me uh, what I'm doing to these other people <laughs> in the game. 
At least that's sort of what I'm taking from a uh, Seagar's view here. You know, I remember playing uh, games before where the remember one was Bard's Tale. And part of the, you could just go into people's houses, or there are all these houses, you go in there, there'd be monsters in the houses, you'd kill the uh, monsters to get experience points and treasure. I remember my, my dad saw me doing that, and he's, he's like, you know, uh, that's not really right. You're kind of breaking into these monsters' houses. They, they have a right, they're just living there, they're not, you know, out attacking people. You're breaking, basically breaking and entering and killing them. That's pretty unethical uh, behavior. <laughs> I don't think he used the term unethical, but <laughs> uh, you get the idea. Uh, but it did, you know, it did make me think about that, and I decided, you know, maybe there would be some other, it must be some better way uh, to get money in this game. And, you know, it wasn't, the game didn't really punish you for doing it, but it, you could do it in other ways, too. So uh, that's a good example, I think, of, uh, you know, it did get me thinking about the morals Again, just a kid. I'm not using words like morality. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, just now that you mention it, Dad, it's, it doesn't feel right. You know, I probably shouldn't do this. And I see, you know, a lot of kids playing games, and their parents will. I've seen that sort of situation over and over again. And if uh, you have kids, I'm sure you have done the same. All right, take a minute to play one of these games. This is the PersuasiveGames.com site, where they make a lot of these games with a point or games with an agenda. Whether you want to call it propaganda or not, that's up to you. But uh, take a look at the anyone you like. Some of them you won't be able to play uh, without signing up or whatever, but there are some that you can play just online. Anyway, play it for a while. Uh, and then come back and describe, how does that game attempt to persuade? Uh, is it effective at doing that? Is it Does it come across as forced or cheesy? Uh, or does it really you know get to move you, make you want to change? Uh, your, your attitude about something, or maybe even uh, do something about it. All right, the public perception of games. You know, we kind of talked about this enough at this point, I think. Uh, suffice it to say, a lot of people that don't play games have a very negative view. Uh, unsophisticated in their form, problematic in their content, the cause of health problems, oh my god, <laughs> when I was a kid, they kept talking about numb thumb. Your kids will be pressing their thumbs up on the Nintendo pad, and that's going to give them numb thumb. I think, whatever, you know, there's, there's so many people died from that. <laughs> anyway, uh, we certainly hear a lot about the obesity. I mean, this just gets, I get so tired of this idea that the, uh, let me turn that off. You know, the kids are on the couch, and they're eating potato chips or whatever, drinking Mountain Dew. And they, they back in it would be back in my day when I was a kid, we were outside playing baseball, <laughs> out enjoying the uh, sub-zero temperatures. I don't know, whatever. Uh, implicated in amorphous cultural fears, right? Somehow this is going to breed uh, generations of criminals, or we'll be in a, a matrix-like situation. There's all this sort of wispy stuff. Uh, this game we're looking at here is one of the first... Uh, no, why is that showing up? Let me uh, close this. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, but uh, the idea of this game, uh, Death Race... I think it's called Death, just Death Race, XID. And this game here, as you can see, it's got the little car... And they, if you, this was in the arcade, so there's an arcade cabinet uh, with this. But the, they said that these little guys running around here are gremlins. So these are like monsters or kind of horror creatures. So you're running over them in your sort of battle car. Uh, but again, somebody that just saw this image would say, look, you're like just running over innocent people. These people are trying to get away. You're chasing them down and, and running over them. Uh, so it seems really horrible. Now, truth be told, I don't know anybody that ever played this game. Uh, you know, it, it's just one of those things. Again, nobody probably would have ever heard about this game if it hadn't been for this controversy and them trying to paint. This is 1976. So even then, they're, they're trying to make out like, this is all games. This is what your kids are doing in the arcades. They're in there running over uh, people. You see that kind of looks like a graveyard. Now I don't know to what extent the people that made this game 
wanted that controversy. You know, we, we all know sometimes if you make something controversial, it gets attention. And some people will want to run out and play it just because of that. You know, I say, whatever you do, don't watch this movie. It is bad. It is obscene. This is horrible movie. And, you know, then everybody goes out and watches it. <laughs> it's just maybe human nature. You're curious. Like, what could it be? I, I got to see this for myself. <laughs> and so there might be a bit of that in there. Uh, but you can see this goes back to 1976. And I don't think anybody called these graphics realistic today. You probably didn't. You know, you might not even know what these things are until I pointed it out. Uh, but anyway, that's just to show you this, this stuff goes way back. All right, so moving on, if I can, if PowerPoint will allow me. The public perception of games is, uh, do we need entertainment to survive? Uh, you know, I, I've had these discussions just so many times, it just doesn't do anything for me anymore. Yeah, sh you know, sure. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go back to like a Neolithic, uh, Paleolithic type situation where you got food, you know, me, we have food, we have a, a cave, that's enough for me, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you know, I don't even know uh, to what extent that's uh, a life worth living. You know, I think you, you need some kind of art, you need theater, you need uh, music and dancing and all that stuff. I, you know, I just don't think you can just boil it all down to this idea of survival. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, the Protestant work that ethic. <coughs> so this is what some of the sociologists have said is the reason that we, uh, at least in the West, tend to frown upon entertainment we see entertainment as being uh, frivolous, unnecessary. You, know, you probably do it too much. You ought to be out tilling a field <laughs> or, or doing more homework. I don't know. We always feel like we ought to be doing, we ought to be more productive. You haven't been very productive today. You've just spent all day playing a Twilight Princess, you know? <laughs> so why, why do we feel this guilt about stuff like that? And again, you go to another culture, another country, they just look at you strange. Like, why does that bother you? Isn't it great that you have all this time on your hands? You can play a game all day? You know, shouldn't that make you happy? <laughs> I'd love to have that kind of free time. Uh, so instead of being happy about it, a lot of us feel guilty about it. And Ve Max Weber, he was a, one of the early sociologists talking about what is, you know, what is society all about. Uh, he says that there's this thing in the West... So in the America, and I guess a lot of uh, the America, <laughs> the U.S., a lot of these other uh, Western countries in Europe, uh, they have what he calls the Protestant work ethic. So this kind of has religious connotations, but you can read about the Protestant work ethic on your own. Uh, but there is this idea that you should value hard work. You know, we, we work hard. We stay sober. Uh, we're frugal. We save money. You know, we... Uh, we, we're very serious people, almost puritanical. Uh, and we feel bad if we get too far away from this, you know, too many days off. Uh, if you're having a little too much fun and partying, you know, that sort of thing is looked down on, looked down upon. Uh, every Anything else is suspect than this. So, you know, I know people, I'm sure you do, especially people of a certain generation, and they basically just work all the overtime, they can, uh, you know, they, they've got plenty of money. They don't really need all this extra money, but they just feel like they have to work. Like, you, they won't take time off. They work right through vacations. You know, they never have any fun, <laughs> as far as I can see. <laughs> you know, they would never uh, do anything just for fun, right? It's always got to be make something tied to their job or making money. It's just kind of stuck in this uh, work ethic, basically. And then they say others uh, bash games as escapism, and, but there's some uh, pushback on that idea too, right? This, well, you're just playing these video games to escape from what's really important. You know, there's this idea that, I remember this thing called the Wow Widows. And it was, it was talking about these spouses that their uh, significant others, it wasn't just uh, husbands, but husbands and wives, their husband, their wife, or spouse would be playing these games so much and they would start to feel ignored. And so they would say, that's a, this person obviously is addicted to the game, right? It's not that they just, that I'm not that much fun to hang out with. 
<laughs> you know, clearly must be something about the game. Uh, who knows? But anyway, this Andrew Evans, he's a psychologist, and he's saying that, well, it probably has something... Games are important because they, they play a role in psychological development. You know, we certainly... We've talked before about the kids will play little games. They'll make up their own games and little rules. And, and what Evans says is that's not just the kid being silly. You know, that's just actually the kid's kind of working through mentally, uh, learning things and trying out roles that will come in useful uh, later in life, right? Th these are basically how you become a human is playing these games, acting out these roles, these fantasies, the, the make-believe, uh, imaginary friends, or what, what have you. And I, this is kind of silly to me, but I thought I'd bring it up just because it is. It always gets brought up, right? Video game violence, and there's always the student that's just obsessed with this topic, and I'm like, come on, right? can't you use anything else? I'm just so tired of this. But, uh, but okay, you know, so they'll go back and they'll dig up this uh, game, <laughs> Night Trap. <laughs> <laughs> like what in God's I mean this was like the horrible first of all it was a Sega CD game and, and I don't know hardly anybody that had the, the Sega CD uh, much less they would buy this you know crap <laughs> crappy game everybody knew it was crap it was a joke it was such a bad game I mean if you look at the videos it's just, it, you'll laugh hysterically it's so cheesy uh, but anyway, the, again, the media, they'd pick out a few screenshots from it, something like this, and it would look bad, and everybody would be like, oh my god, you know, we got, we got to, I got to throw away my kid's uh, Nintendo. The kid's like, that's a Sega CD game, that's not a Nintendo, Dad. You know, mom, ah, mom, come back. <laughs> I don't even have that game. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, again, just making out like, this is the all video games. Look at that, it's just so violent. Uh, then there was another example more recently with uh, this hot coffee mod. So this would take some a while to explain, and this is a Rockstar game. So they, you know, they do kind of. I think they are one of those companies that wants to be controversial, but I, I don't know the full details of this. But again, it was one of those things. One, one of the things that was interesting about it, I should say, is that uh, if you just buy the game, you would never see this hot coffee. It's basically an X-rated. I think it's. I haven't actually seen it, <laughs> the sequence, but some kind of obscene sequence that will you wouldn't you would never see it just normally playing the game. But if you downloaded a code or installed something, you know you had to basically hack the game to see this this uh, profane content. And of course, people didn't understand that, and they just like look at what these people put in their game. Look, this is horrible. You know, it's it's por it's porno in the form of a game and you know all the kids are playing it I mean, first of all it was I don't even I'm pretty sure this was after they had the ratings uh, so it was supposed to be for uh, 17 year old and up I think originally but anyway after this it got labeled as adults only so basically porn and they lost some money on it but you know I don't really know what to make of that I never quite understood why they would put that in there to begin with and I'm, you know, come on. <laughs> they must have known it was there. <laughs> it just kind of smells like a PR stunt to me. Uh, but again, it's just the, the, the media grabs this and they say, look, this is games, right? All games are putting these secret codes in there. And, the, you know, you think your kid's playing Mario, but it's really like this horrible uh, porno. Uh, and then there's this idea, again, gets stated all the time, no evidence. They, they, they keep saying this, well, a gamer... Especially if it's a game that looks real. They say they can't tell the difference. They can't tell the game that they're playing a game versus the real world. You know, so you're killing all these orcs in World of Warcraft, and then you go outside and you're still killing... <laughs> what? You know, I've never I've never come across somebody who couldn't uh, tell when they were playing a game like World of Warcraft and when they're in a class, <laughs> for example. <laughs> you know, sometimes they might be playing the game in the classroom. That's a, a different issue. Uh, there's just no evidence to back it up, and there's a really good uh, show episode of a Pen and Teller. You can look this up. They're magicians from Las Vegas, but they also have this show called, well, I won't say the name of the show. It's kind of profane, but it's Bull S. <laughs> you know, Bull S. I'll let you fill in the blank on that. 
Uh, they do an episode about the video game violence, and it's, it's worth watching because it really, I mean, they do a lot better job than I do of just really when you think about how absurd that is. Uh, you know, the, the idea that these kids are, would play even like a game like Doom or, or whatever and then uh, want to go out and shoot people, their real-life friends, it's just not how it works. Or at least there's no scientific evidence for any of that. You know, it's something that's scary, and it, it sounds, uh, it gets people really alarmed, uh, so they want to start banning everything, uh, even though there's really no, as far as I could tell, still really little to no uh, scientific evidence to back it up. Plenty of anecdotes. Now, let's see. Dimitri Williams argues that these concerns reflect basic conservative fears about new media. Right again, that same old idea. There's something new, you know, we didn't play that, we didn't do that when we were kids, you know, we didn't have this Sega CD, or we didn't have Dungeons and Dragons, so clearly uh, must, this is going to destroy society as we know it if we don't ban it. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, I interviewed a Todd Howard, uh, he's the guy, I think he's a Bethesda, he recently did the uh, Fallout 76 game. Uh, but I think I interviewed him probably a good 10 years before that. <clears throat> he, I forget what they were working on at that point. But anyway, I remember asking him, you know, I said, uh, what, do you, what do you think about all this video game violence? Do you think there's a link there? He says, well, Matt, you know, show me the golden age of peace that existed before video games. <laughs> Like oh that's that's great you know that's how you got that's why you make the big bucks Howard <laughs> you you can come up with a great line like that all right moving on then to players we got why play why do we play video games who is playing them uh, a little bit about female players game communities cooperation and conflict and then uh, game creativity and meta culture so there's another question for you I think we're up to five. Uh, so think about why you, so you individually, just you, don't think about anything else but you. So why do you like playing video games? What is it about them that keeps you coming back? Uh, why do you think you find some games more fun than others? So see if you can come up with a, at least 100 words on that, and then we'll move on. Okay. So why do we enjoy gaming? We've got a couple different views here. This is Juan Alberto Estalo. They, they boost our self-esteem. You know, we get attached to them. You know, I often feel like this. You have one of these frustrating days. You just can't get nothing you do seems to have any make any difference. You just feel like, oh God, you know, I just I don't feel too good. Uh, you play a game, something like Seven Days Minecraft, uh, Stardew Valley is one of my favorites. And, you know, there's just something about it it's relaxing you feel like you know look I'm doing stuff or, you know like playing World of Warcraft you're like let me just log in there for you know 10 minutes do some quests you know you feel like you're kind of getting stuff done right you feel like you're improving your character it just makes you feel better right like this is something I can do I can actually get some uh, see some tangible progress uh, you know I think that's a lot you think about working out you know you work out in a gym lifting weights or running on treadmill or whatever and you might feel like you know I've been doing this for a day or hours and I see no difference <laughs> you know you work out for a week you lose like a half a pound or you know it's, it's, the progress is so slow and even if you do it for many months and you know years even that like the change is so gradual uh, you might not even be able to tell a difference if you have like a before and after photo then you might sort of can sort of tell uh, but if you're just like looking at yourself every day, you don't see any difference. Uh, so that's the, the game, though. You know, you you play World of Warcraft all day long. You know, if you're unless you're just totally horrible at it, you're going to see some improvement in your character, uh, some new items, a new level if you're leveling up. You know, there'll be something there that you can see. So that's that idea of uh, something tangible that boosts the esteem. You can see uh, that you've made some progress. Now let's see, Sue Morris says they provide a degree of authorship, right? This idea of you don't just have to go with what the novel author says. You, you, you can sort of control this narrative, right? You have some choices. It's sort of your story. It's not just uh, the story that the author came up with. Uh, right, Boria and Brebot says we can use them to escape alienation 
and engage in a kind of activity that goes beyond consumerism. So you can see this is a very Marxist point of view, but yeah, a lot of people, they, they're really lonely. I mean, let's face it, we could say go outside and play, but maybe you don't live in a good neighborhood and it's actually would be dangerous to go out there. <laughs> maybe you just don't like it. Uh, so games give you something to do. Uh, it goes beyond consumerism. Yeah, so a lot of these games, people think gaming is an expensive hobby. You know, it really just, it's like the cheapest hobby, really. I mean, you can play a game for thousands and thousands of hours sometimes, and really you only spent like the 20 bucks to buy it. <laughs> you know, a movie, how many times can you really watch a movie uh, over and over again before you just get absolutely sick of it? And this is the, I just don't know how to even go about pronouncing this name. Six Sense Mahali, Mahali? maybe probably should look that up <laughs> anyway uh, that book is really it's a really well-known book it's called flow I think that might be the title flow a state of optimal experience but it's, it's this idea of uh, the flow and I wanted to break it down a little bit more here for you let's see if I can move my, yeah move that over a little bit so Mihaly's uh, model of flow is related to challenge and ability you know, so the idea here is you kind of get into what I would call the zone uh, when you're playing a game that's just difficult enough. You know, it's some games you play, you just feel frustrated, or you it's just it feels loose, you're kind of wonky, you don't feel like you have tight control over it, uh, or it's boring, or you don't care about it. But you know, at certain times, certain games, you just it just sort of clicks, right? And you get into this groove or this what they call the flow. You know, it's just challenging enough. You know, you're able to do it. You're staying focused on it. Uh, you're you're happy <laughs> as you're doing this. <laughs> Everything just feels great. Uh, and, and people, six and hot mahali. They talk about how this uh, happens whether you're playing sports. You know, sometimes you're playing sports, you just kind of disengage. You're not really into it. Uh, then other times you're like you're there. Right? Just everything comes together. And next thing you know, like two hours have passed. Uh, but you don't feel tired or anything. You're just really uh, focused and happy. So that's what they call the uh, this idea of the flow. And obviously it's something that the game publishers would love to uh, learn more about this. How do I get my... <laughs> trying to get my... There we go. Uh, so I definitely think there's something to this. You know, I've certainly noticed this. When I'm playing games, you know, sometimes everything just works, right? Uh, there's McGonagall, Jane McGonagall. Uh, she's got a wonderful book. You know, she's one of these great writers. She just, it's just so. I really recommend that her book, Reality Is Broken. She's got TED talks, but I mean, it's just so inspiring. Makes you want to go out and do stuff. Uh, she talks about games in this context of uh, blissful productivity. So I was kind of talking about this before with uh, the World of Warcraft. I think I was jumping ahead to McGonagall a little, a little bit. But she talks about it like we kind of, we have this Protestant work ethic, so we want to do work, but we want to do satisfying work. You don't want to just do tedious work or do work that nobody appreciates or that you can't see any reward for doing. Uh, so you, you're basically working. I mean, games are work. It takes a lot of work to raise a character up from level one all the way to level 100 or whatever it is. Uh, in a World of Warcraft game, there's a lot of grinding. What they call grinding just means sort of tedious stuff you do over and over again. Uh, but yet, you know, it leads to the satisfying result. We, we want to do it. We don't have to be paid to do it. Uh, it's just somehow satisfying. And so I think she's just absolutely correct about this. Yeah, there's this joy, success, being good at something. Uh, the social connections you form with uh, people or even with the characters in the game, uh, I would say. But certainly when you're talking with other players... Uh, craving the meaning, something beyond ourselves. So sort of the same reasons people like uh, the team sports, right? You, you know, you're part of a team. Or if you're playing a game with a storyline, a lot of times you feel like you're part of that story. Like you're there to save the universe. <laughs> there to fight the horde or whatever. Uh, so it gives you that sort of meaning to your life. Whereas you can imagine, you know, if you lead this tedious life, you know, you got your nine to five job, it's very boring, nobody really cares about you, uh, you're coming home all by yourself. I'm kind of exaggerating this a little bit, but uh, you can see how this kind of uh, 
situation would be improved if you could just get online and uh, you know play some games. And there's, there's a movie called Ready Player One and a book. I think the novel came first, but I think that gets at a lot of these uh, concepts we're talking about here. Uh, Sherry Turkle, uh, she talks about games as well. She's one of these foundational scholars. And she's got another book where she kind of disses all this stuff. She's, she's kind of gone the other direction now. But in her early books, uh, she was talking about how games let us experiment with different identities. She talks about there's no unified self. Let me just uh, jump ahead to Waskell here. And De Dennis Waskell, something similar. He says, Boundaries inevitably implode as person, players, and personas blend and blur into an experience that necessarily involves all three. Uh, so this is where I, you know, people like to talk about this. Uh, games that let you create your own character whether that be World of Warcraft, something online like that, or even uh, Skyrim. And they'll say, well, you know, I'm a biological male, but I, I like to play as a, as a female character. You know, there's, you could really just play whatever you like. And uh, Turkle's saying this is a, one of the cool things about games, especially these online games. Nobody is going to say, well, you can't do that. You know, they, they can't see you. <laughs> you can basically present yourself uh, however you like. Uh, you can try on basically all kinds of different identities, experiment with them, you know, see what it's like, see how people respond to you in these different contexts, and that can be very uh, educational. It can be very enlightening, uh, not to mention fun, I think. And then, uh, you know, Wasco here is just kind of going a little step further than that, saying sometimes uh, this does just sort of blur together. Uh, the second life comes up a lot in these discussions, and people will say things like, well, I met my... I met my, uh, there's a lot of articles I remember when Second Life was popular about the, you know, I met my spouse in Second Life, in this, a different spouse than in my real life or something like this. And they, they had like their wife or their husband in Second Life and then the, uh, their re, uh, real uh, husband, wife in the other life. And there's like all these, all these sort of articles, people just like, what, how the heck is that <laughs> going to work? <laughs> you know, and of course, a lot of people do meet their significant others online and you know, whether they meet up in real life or not, you see, even even I like slip into this language of like real versus fake, but, but really it's just life. You know, whether physically, I guess you could say, whether you ever meet physically is often not the biggest thing. You know, you're still connecting with these, these folks. These, you know, the friends you have in World of Warcraft, whether or not you've ever physically met them uh, doesn't mean they're not your friends. It's not like they're lesser friends, you know, especially if you... You know, you can look at it that way if you, if you choose to, but it, I think what uh, Waskell's saying there is it's not really necessary uh, to think that way. Oh, yes, and this is the grief players. <clears throat> this is one thing I wish that we could figure out. <laughs> you know, whether you want to call them trolls or ninja looters, you know, there's different terms for this. You know, I think it's just sort of a, an unfortunate thing of human society. You know, you're always going to have that person there you know, that's just going to try their damnedest to ruin it for everybody else. And, you know, if, if you see kids on a playground, there's always that one kid that's just kind of uh, the troublemaker or just the one who's always like, no matter what the idea is, they, they want to tear it down, right? They always want to uh, to show off or show out, whatever. You know, to me, that's it's the same thing. It's just some for some reason, maybe in the video game world, it's just more obvious or it, it, people pay more attention to it. You know, I don't know what the, the deal is. And unfortunately, it is one of those things, again, where the few bad apples, they get all the attention. You know, I use the example of traffic or how people drive. So you'll hear uh, people say, man, the people in St. Cloud just can't drive. They can't drive. Like, what are you talking about? Well, and then somebody will have cut them off or, you know, slid on the ice too far or whatever. And you're thinking... I always think, well, that was that one person or maybe two people, you know, all the other people there, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, no issues, They're, everybody's fine, <laughs> you know, and it's like this with the students as well, I will say as a teacher, like almost all students are just fine, lovely people, you know, they're there to learn, <laughs> they're very respectful, there's not a, a, any issues whatsoever, you know, it's a beautiful thing, uh, but yet, yeah, there'll always be that one. <laughs> <laughs> maybe two. 
and they just take up all your mental energy and all your time. Uh, you know, they really frustrate you, and it's just like weighing you down emotionally. And you're just like, man, if I could just lose those, you know, that one person out of this class, everybody, you know, just be a beautiful thing again. Uh, but I don't know if you, this is my question. I don't know. Could you do that? Even if I could, just say, okay, you, you, and you, wow. You know, maybe then, maybe what would happen then is uh, somebody else in the class would take on that role. Uh, you know, I don't really know how it works. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, <laughs> but it just seems to me inevitable that you're going to have this problem of these griefers. So these are basically just people there. They're just there to try to, you know, basically ruin the experience. They they basically get off on uh, making everybody else miserable one way or the other. You know, and they, like here's in one Fortnite event ended in a new record for solo kills for one player who <laughs> broke the ceasefire. So you see these stories all over the place. I don't, you know, again, I don't know why people like doing stuff like this. I, I've seen it over and over again, though. It's just, <laughs> you know, I remember playing World of Warcraft sometimes. And this, I think they might have fixed this problem before, but, you know, there for a while there was this, I... You know, somebody could kill you in PvP, uh, or another player could kill you, and then they would just stay there on your corpse. You know, and every time you tried to come back, they would just kill you again, and just kill you again. And, you know, sometimes I would uh, go leave the thing on and go get some coffee, go eat lunch, come back, and that son of a gun would still be there, like half an hour later, just just waiting to do this again. It's like, who's got the time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how pathetic. It's, it's kind of sad, really, you know, that that's a, that that's a thing. But, you know, again, I think the problem is you don't want to go from that and say, well, that's all World of Warcraft players. You know, look how toxic uh, this uh, World of Warcraft community is. You know, basically making that same problem as the, making that same leap as the people in St. Cloud can't drive. You know, don't judge this whole community. Uh, based on the one or two or whatever tiny percent of uh, griefers there are. Uh, anyway, question six. So now we're moving into uh, female gamers. Uh, so I found a, a site called LifeWire, and they have one of these top ten lists. It's called the 10 Best Fun Games for Girls in 2020. So I thought it'd be fun. Uh, take a look at this list, choose one of the games, learn a little bit more about it. Maybe you played some of these. And then discuss why you think it is that that game has attracted a larger share of female games or female gamers uh, than other games like it. So, what is it about this that you think might explain this uh, demographic uh, shift? All right, so here's a slide about some books and some studies of uh, female players or women as players of games, and you can you can see the range there. Uh, some of these, I think most of these are probably from the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, but there's been, been plenty of uh, follow-ups on this. Uh, but a lot of the game study scholars that write on this, they're either interested in the representation of women in video games. Uh, so I remember one was talking about the uh, Halo series and say, look at the way Master Chief is represented. Kind of got this armor on, you got the helmet on, you don't really see his face, big, strong, muscular you know, uh, physique and all this. Uh, in charge and whatever. Uh, and then you look at Cortana, which she's uh, portrayed as this, you know, basically naked uh, lady, transparent, uh, literally like inside Master Chief's uh, uh, <laughs> computer armor. <laughs> you know, I forget the details, but, you know, they're saying there, there's, there's a lot of uh, implications here from a, a feminist perspective. You know, and same thing with like Lara Croft and, you know, goes on and on. So there's that, that kind of study. And then there's uh, other studies of like women as gamers. You know, there are a lot of, you could get on YouTube and find like endless videos of the, you know, sort of just, uh, I don't know what else to call it, but just barbaric uh, treatment. You know, it's again, come back to this idea of the griefers, right? No shortage of those. You know, I, unfortunately, I do think it, it tends to get uh, insinuated sometimes that that's all that there is. You know, there's, there's plenty of great uh, guilds on World of Warcraft run by and for women. Uh, my guild uh, that I was in, probably mostly women, I never had any treatment. You know, if anything like that had ever happened, we'd have instantly booted the, you know, kicked out that uh, griefer. 
uh, without a second thought. You know, so, <laughs> so, you know, I just don't want to get to get the idea that all uh, online gaming is this horribly, uh, you know, sexist thing. Uh, and indeed, there are lots of uh, game studios that are run by women. You know, unfortunately, they tend to get uh, ignored, which is kind of bizarre. You know, you're sitting there writing a book about uh, the need for more female game developers and female companies. And they never mention, like, the number one company, uh, Her Interactive. <laughs> you know, I've interviewed several folks from that uh, studio, but they, they do a lot of games based on the uh, Nancy Drew books. Which a hugely successful series. There's something like 30 games in that series. Again, you just never hear it mentioned. Uh, sometimes I wonder if like the, what's really sexist is the coverage. Because <laughs> you know if they really were talking, if they were serious about promoting the female studios, they would talk about her interactive. And there's several other companies. I just interviewed uh, uh, Annie Vandermeer. You know she's uh, making games, putting them out there, and it's just one of many, many. You know, I don't know why they keep claiming that there's just not uh, any female-run companies. <clears throat> just not true. And they just don't get the attention they uh, they deserve. But, you know, I do agree. That's, that's the solution. <clears throat> All right, game communities. This is on page 181, so they're just talking here about the, you know, World of Warcraft. What does it mean to say World of Warcraft community? What does it mean to say the Fortnite 2 community or the the, the player base of Rust? <laughs> There's this game called Rust, and I remember that uh, it always got brought up as like this really toxic community. You know, I'm hoping I hope I hope I'm thinking of the right game there. Uh, versus these other companies, I remember the was it Guild Wars 2 or there were a lot of talk about well the game community for this MMO is a lot more welcoming, uh, a lot more diverse. Uh, than this community over here, which is just a bunch of toxic, uh, <laughs> you know, there's terrible people uh, in this other community. Uh, so it's a lot of discussions along those lines, but uh, what we want to do here is delve a little more deeply into it, see if we can start to understand these as communities. So questions of like, how do you join this community? Is there a fee that you pay? Is it a free-to-play game? Uh, is it, uh, you have to be a certain age? You know, there's all sorts of ways you can restrict the membership. Uh, the relationships uh, that people have in the game, you know, to what extent is that controlled or enforced by rules? Remember that one of the ex examples from uh, World of Warcraft that got brought up in the book is you got the, I think they were talking about EverQuest, but uh, anyway, WoW is the same deal. You have like a horde and an alliance, and if you choose one of those others, you can't really deal, you can't really talk too much to the other side. You know, they, they sort of block the chatting. You can only chat with people from the, that are other uh, allies or other horde members you know and then when you get into the battlegrounds you're like fighting that other faction so that's kind of built into the game uh, but there's other ways that these games sort of instill relationships uh, the commitment to the game generalized uh, reciprocity i think this kind of ties into this shared values and practice uh, so sometimes uh, you feel like well that this company didn't really or, you know, I'm playing World of Warcraft. I don't really feel welcome. You know, I tried to join this guild. They, they wouldn't let me join the guild. <laughs> they, and they, isn't that a terrible thing? And then you say, well, how long have you been playing? And say, well, I've just created an account. You know, and I'm using, like, the trial account. Well, maybe they don't feel like you've really committed to the game enough. Uh, or maybe they don't think there will be this opportunity for the generalized reciprocity. You know, we could even bring, like, the collective goods into this. Uh, so well, what happens with these guilds? in a uh, world of warcraft is they have a what they call a guild bank and there's stuff in the guild bank that's some of it's for uh you know people that have been in the guild for a long time uh and then there'll be another tab there or another shelf i guess for uh just anybody you know brand if you're brand new to the guild you might be able to get a few uh, some gold or some potions or whatever uh but there is this expectation that you know, you have to commit. You know, if you are there committed, if you're active in that guild for uh, sometimes uh, many months or years even, you know, you're going to have this a different kind of relationship uh, than somebody that just pops in on that free trial account <laughs> and expects to, to, like, clear the guild bank. Uh, so there's, there's, it's not really all that different, I think, than just any community, the neighborhood community I live in. 
Uh, the St. Cloud State University, if you want to think about that as a community, you know, you think membership, well, I have to pay tuition. I have to send an application. Uh, relationships, you know, you've got your, your classmates, we're in class together. Uh, you're in a major, a minor, you know, those are relationships and on down the list. So it's, I think it's, it's a nice way to think about game communities. It's not being like this weird, totally different thing uh, than what you see in a really any other walk of life. All right, then to, to wrap things up here, uh, we've got the game uh, Creativity and the Metaculture Around Games, which this to me is really the fascinating stuff. Uh, the modding community, so people will take a game like, one of the first ones I'm trying to think, what was it? They talked about Doom, I think, in the book, but uh, I really saw this with the Neverwinter Nights games, the, uh, oh geez, so many of them. Uh, Many anyway, what they'll do, they'll, they'll take a game, I think Half-Life 2 is a, or is it Half-Life or Half-Life 2? <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the developer basically releases some of the code or some of the, the packages or some of the underlying stuff so that you can go in and like change the way the game looks. So maybe you think it'd be fun to take out the, uh, the, the monsters and replace them with uh, bunny rabbits or something. Or with uh, Neverwinter Nights, uh, those games, they came with this engine so you could make your own adventures, your own stories, and share those. You know, and all the, a lot of the role-playing games do this. Uh, but the idea is they're sharing these mods, what they call them, and you could download them and make your own. And, you know, sometimes uh, this is how games get made and sold. Uh, Counter-Strike was a mod. And somebody just did that for fun, but then the company decided, hey, this is really popular, it's really taken off, we'll officially uh, package this. Uh, Esports, official competitions, another thing. You know, this, you think about us, the Vikings. You can go see Vikings games, but really the Vikings are about a lot more than just the, the games. You know, there's all the merchandise, there's the, <laughs> all the stories that people tell, you know, and different kinds of ways to participate uh, as a Viking fan. You know, same thing with these esports. Uh, online forums and lingo. So again, you get onto the forums to learn more about some strategies, maybe, or just see what's happening, you know, when's the sequel coming out, whatever. Uh, but then you might get tied in and say, this is kind of fun. I like this thread over here. Like, what, what's your favorite character? And uh, some people uh, even get into, like, uh, uh, the fan fiction. Like, let's just write a story about, you know, these two characters uh, fell in love, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, the lingo refers to, like, special uh, language they use if you're talking about like pugs. Uh, in World of Warcraft, they talk about, I don't want a pug, or I hate pugs. <laughs> You're like, well, you have something against a little dog? Uh, well, they're talking about pick up groups, and which just means that instead of running some content with uh, your friends or your guild mates, you're just kind of in there with random people, and you never know what you're going to get. Uh, so pug you know, is an example of some of that lingo. Now, the book talks about how Sometimes people use this lingo as a way to like signal that they're insiders and like if you don't get the lingo or you're not using the lingo appro appropriately, then you're a newbie, novice, you know, we don't want you around. So it can get kind of nasty, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's just kind of a shortcut, uh, a language shortcut. <coughs> All right, let's see if we can get this done. <laughs> uh, kind of dry here this time of year. Uh, lastly, there's these, uh, well, there's two things. There's the game guides, wikis, walkthroughs, and uh, machinima. So some people, again, they like to go a step beyond just playing a game. They want to do something more creative. They want to exercise their writing skills. Uh, so you'll see these game guides, you know, maps and things of the world, what you can do. Uh, wikis, uh, which is sort of, you're kind of in there with other people explaining different aspects of the game, giving tips. Uh, a walkthrough, very similar, maybe identical to a game guide. Now, the machinima, sometimes people take the clips, or they'll take clips from a game and make it into like a cartoon, uh, complete with uh, voice acting. So, <laughs> very creative. <laughs> uh, and then finally, beta testing, uh, so you can get involved with games as they're being made and ha have a little input into that process, maybe even provide feedback and change the game. 
All right, woo. Uh, so thanks for watching all this. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I think it's some pretty fun uh, topics. But uh, anyway, if you can think of a question you'd like to ask, uh, please do so. If you want to make a comment, I always enjoy seeing those. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.